The biggest official Pokemon tournament ever was held last year, and I beat almost 800 players in order to take home the championship. But almost exactly one year later, a new tournament would shatter that record, and my title of winner of the biggest tournament ever would be in jeopardy. So I set out to win the largest official Pokemon tournament of all time for the second year in a row. But similar to the marathon I keep telling myself that I'll run, this is easier said than done. It is really hard to win a Pokemon tournament. You need to win 12 out of 14 rounds to safely make it into the final eight players. And the bigger the tournament is, the steeper the competition. At Orlando, the previous largest tournament, my last five opponents included a regional champion, a world second place finisher, and two different international champions. And none of this is even considering how the various luck-based elements in Pokemon make it much harder to win consistently. Winning an event this big even once means you needed to have a day where everything went perfectly, where throughout heaven and earth, you alone are the honored one. But trying to do it again, back to back, it would either take a miracle or somebody who is simply built different. Maybe somebody with the world champ difference. But this world champion has uh, been on a little bit of a hiatus. See, last year I took competing extremely seriously and I went to more tournaments than I ever had before. And who could have seen this one coming? I burnt myself out really badly. Like so badly, I basically spent two months just lying in bed and reading the entirety of One Piece to try and recover. Not a good time for me. One Piece is really good though. Anyway, after a disappointing finish at the World Championships last year, I decided to take four months off from attending events, except for a quick trip up to a tournament in Pittsburgh where I somehow managed to finish second. The break was exactly what I needed, but getting back into the game would take some serious work. Scarlet and Violet released two major DLC expansions, introducing tons of new and returning Pokemon into the game. And while my competitors have had plenty of time to learn how to optimize Blood Moon Ursaluna, or that Okidogi can actually be good in the right context, I'm still trying to figure out what the heck Ogre Pond's masks do. Our story begins on New Year's Eve, as I'm flying home from a ski trip with some of my best friends. As I sit in my stupid, cramped airplane seat, I realize something. I'm excited to play Pokemon again. With so many events last year, I think I hit a point where going to tournaments started to feel more like work. And even though, yes, technically Pokemon is my job, I still want to play because I love it and not because I'm worried <laughs> Big Boss Pikachu will fire me if I don't compete. But now, I realize I'm really looking forward to Charlotte Regionals and the chance to defend my title as champion of the biggest tournament of all time. And as if this realization has flipped some internal switch, all of a sudden, I'm back in Pokemon mode. The airplane starts to shake as the mental floodgates open and idea after idea enters my head. Pokemon after Pokemon that I could use to achieve victory. Or maybe there was just some turbulence. See, before you enter a Pokemon tournament, you need to build a team. Six Pokemon fully kitted out with the best moves, items, abilities, stats, and Terra types you can think of. Once the tournament starts, you won't be able to change anything about your Pokemon. So you'd better make sure that whichever six Pokemon you bring can beat anything and everything your opponents might throw at you. In my opinion, building a team is by far the hardest part of preparing for a tournament. And entering a tournament with a bad team is the quickest way to make an emergency exit. So no pressure. I think I entered some Pokemon induced fugue state on the airplane and blacked out. I regain consciousness as the plane touches down, and when I look down at my trembling hands, I see something. A note in my phone with the blueprint of a team. We'll get into the specific details of the team later, as some things will change from this initial idea. But funnily enough, despite this note appearing three weeks before the tournament, every single one of these five Pokemon would end up being on my final team. Here's the idea behind them and why I think they could work. Furgraph is a Pokemon that I've been a big believer in for months. It's got this broken ability called Armor Tail that stops all opposing priority attacks while it's on the field. I love abilities like this that give you control over the battle. It's why I love Gothitelle and its ability that stops your opponents from switching. Just like Gothitelle, Furigraph can also use the move Trick Room, which lets slow Pokemon move before faster ones. Now, it's worth noting that Frigoraph is almost always used as a support Pokemon, but I think an offensive set could work instead. My idea is that Frigoraph is naturally tanky, which lets it set up Trick Room, but it actually has a very respectable special attack stat. 
Of course, we're not talking about like a Fluttermane special attack stat, but you can make Fragoreth even stronger by giving it the Throat Spray item, which will give it a special attack boost after it uses the move Hyper Voice, which also happens to be a great option on Fragoreth as it's a normal type move that hits both opponents. After a Throat Spray, Frigoraf's damage output is pretty comparable to Fluttermane with a booster energy. This lets Frigoraf work both as a Trick Room Setter and a Trick Room Sweeper, something you normally need two different Pokemon for. Now, this does sound very powerful, but uh, I did use this exact Frigoraf set at two different events last year, and uh, neither went especially well for me. Only time will tell if third time's the charm or if this is just like Charlie Brown and Lucy with the football. Oh yeah, this is probably a good time to mention that a lot of thought and work goes into making a team at the top level. And I'm only really able to convey so much of that in a video. If you're interested in learning about this team and process at a much more in-depth level, I've posted a ton of extra content on Patreon, including tons of practice replays sorted by matchup, a detailed explanation for every single EV spread, a how to team build video with this team as an example, and a whole lot more. I'm posting three extra videos a month there in addition to bonus content with my tournament teams. So yeah, it's a great resource. Speaking of tournament teams, if you watched any of my videos last year, you probably noticed that I tried really hard to make unorthodox, undervalued Pokemon work at almost every event I attended. And you might expect me to be doing something similar this year. So let me tell you plain and simple, I am done using bad Pokemon. I feel like I've been putting myself at such a disadvantage by using Pokemon like Tankaton while my competitors are using Iron Hands. There is a time and a place for niche Pokemon, and I'm more than happy to do it during online tournaments that I can stream for content. But this season, as a competitor, my goal is to get the best results I can. And that means making Game Freak regret ever putting some of these monstrosities in the game. If you know a thing or two about competitive Pokemon, you know that Incineroar is arguably the single best Pokemon of all time. It has one of the best abilities ever made, incredible defensive typing, a completely absurd supporting move pool, I could go on. Anything a support Pokemon could want, Incineroar has. But here's where things get unexpected. This tournament I'm preparing for, Charlotte Regionals, is the second event that Incineroar will be legal for in Scarlet and Violet. And at the first event, Incineroar had a completely embarrassing showing, with only two present in the top eight competitors. This is the best Pokemon of all time, so why is nobody using it? They think it's bad. Competitive players think Incineroar is done for. Top competitive players are slandering it, calling it mid Cineroar. YouTubers are posting videos about how it fell off. Spoiler alert, look at these usage stats from Charlotte Regionals. Incineroar has less usage than Tornadus and Amoongus. Listen, I really do not like Incineroar. I think it is completely overpowered and just terribly designed from a competitive angle. But if there is one thing that I dislike more than the wrestling cat, it's Pokemon players disrespecting the greatest of all time. And for the first time in my life, I found myself relating to Incineroar. I know what it's like for people to call you washed after one bad tournament. I know what it's like for people to discredit your accomplishments, to pretend your peaks weren't actually that high. And I realized that no matter what anybody else thinks, Incineroar is still my goat, whether I like it or not. If these other players want to write off Incineroar, well, it's their funeral, and I'll be the one carrying the casket. Oh yeah, it's worth noting that even though the Pokemon themselves might not be uh, super out there, that doesn't mean I'm not going to get creative. I'll be looking for new ways to use these top threats to bring up potential that other people have missed. But we'll talk more about that later. The next Pokemon I want is Rillaboom. Rillaboom is a monkey. And just like Incineroar, it also learns the supporting move Fake Out. Rillaboom, Incineroar, and Fragoraf will form the backbone of my team. Incineroar and Rillaboom can help Frigoroth set Trick Room up with Fake Out. And because they're all relatively slow, they can serve not just as supporting Pokemon, but damaging ones once the dimensions are twisted. I can use Frigoroth's Armor Tail even in matchups where I don't want Trick Room. And Incineroar and Rillaboom have a ton of utility out of Trick Room in addition to Fake Out. Intimidate is always useful, and Grassy Surge is an amazing tool against teams that rely on Psychic Terrain. On top of all of that, both Incineroar and Rillaboom pair immense bulk with a move that switches them out. 
allowing them to capitalize on their lower speed stats to let a faster and frailer Pokemon switch in without risk of taking too much damage. I have a fire type, I have a grass type, I probably want a water type. And in the spirit of using the strongest Pokemon, I'm going to use Urshifu Water. With a Choice Scarf, it outspeeds any Pokemon that doesn't also have a speed boost. And the ability to hit through Protect pairs extremely well with my Fake Out support. To be honest, I have never been very good at using Urshifu, but if I want to use the strongest Pokemon this year, I'm probably going to have to figure it out at some point. Lastly, Fluttermane, the number one most used Pokemon for a reason. My initial thought was to use the booster energy to boost Fluttermane's special attack stat, but I'll come up with a better set that nobody else has used before later, so let's not dwell on it too much right now. A day later, I put my idea into the team builder and start practicing, using Raging Bolt as the last Pokemon for now because that gives me twice as many giraffes. I play my first games of the format, and just like when I would show up to class having forgotten about a test, immediately start learning a ton. It doesn't take me long to realize that beating Amoongus, Urshifu, and Arcaladon is uh, not very easy, so I'll need the final Pokemon to be able to help against them. After a couple more games, I feel confident that the five Pokemon that appeared in my vision will work, and I've already identified potential candidates for the final Pokemon on the team. Raging Bolt, Latios, and Ogre Pond Hearth Flame. My gut says the last Pokemon should be Ogre Pond Hearth Flame. It's one of the best Pokemon against Amoongus because, as a grass type, it's immune to Spore, and as a fire type, it sautés mushrooms. Because I already have Rillaboom, I can also use Grassy Glide to threaten a KO on Urshifu Water, even if they're holding a Choice Scarf. While most Ogre Pond run Follow Me as their last move, if I use Swords Dance, I can potentially have another Pokemon that capitalizes on my dual Fake Out wielders with the added benefit that Swords Dance allows Ogre Pond to outpace Incineroar's Intimidate, and I absolutely refuse to disrespect Incineroar. Within 24 hours, I reach number 5 on the ladder, and I realize this team is legit. It is not refined, and I still have some work to do, but the foundation is here. The next day, I decide to try out Walking Wake over Urshifu because Urshifu just isn't clicking for me and I reach number three on the ladder. Walking Wake doesn't feel great, so I switch back to Urshifu. But because I had the Bizarre Dinosaur on my team, I had started to consider other Fluttermane options. Maybe Sunny Day Fluttermane to power up Walking Wake. Uh, but that doesn't really make sense if I drop Walking Wake. Maybe Speed Boosting Fluttermane with Icy Wind could work? Uh, that doesn't feel good either. Maybe Calm Mind Speed Boosting Terra Grass Fluttermane? This is a completely unorthodox set, and as far as I know, one that nobody else is even thinking about. But on this specific team, I think that it can work. Calm Mind Fluttermane is yet another Pokemon that can take advantage of the double fake out core, and even more so because Incineroar's Intimidate helps Fluttermane's low physical defense out a ton, and Rillaboom's Grassy Terrain provides much needed healing. With these three Pokemon and a defensive Terra type of Grass, Fluttermane should be able to set up at least one Calm Mind. And after that one Calm Mind and the Speed Booster energy, Fluttermane has the speed of a Choice Scarf, the damage of a Choice Specs, and the bulk of an Assault Vest, all with none of the drawbacks. And this Fluttermane can serve as my answer against a team that is quickly rising in popularity, Caliper, Amoongus, Arcaladon, and Incineroar. The new Pokemon Arcaladon is incredibly tanky with the Assault Vest item, and it's very dangerous because every time it takes any damage, it gets a defense boost, not only making it harder to remove, but also powering up its Body Press attack. If you try to ignore it, it can boost its special attack stat with its signature move Electro Shot, a basically super-powered solar beam that gives the user a special attack boost and doesn't take a charging turn if it's in the rain. And with Amoongus supporting it by slowing down opponents with Spore, keeping it safe with Rage Powder, and healing it for 50% of its health with Pollen Puff, plus Incineroar being, well, Incineroar, getting rid of it is a nightmare for most teams. For my team, nightmare is an understatement. Excluding Fluttermane, I have four physical attackers and Ferrigraph, but Arcaladon resists all of Ferrigraph's moves. After a couple days of testing, my friend Billa asked me about the matchup, and I realized I have absolutely no way through Arcaladon. So either Fluttermane is going to have to figure something out, or I'm going to have to go back to the drawing board. But then I come up with this specific Fluttermane set, and it seems like it can work, so I decided to start testing. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, I mean, okay, he, he just changed one set. Like, this matchup was completely unwinnable. How much could it realistically improve with just this one Pokemon moveset change? 
My friend Billa took the earlier version of the team, the one with special attack boosting Fluttermane, to a European tournament. And even though he got eliminated the first day, he learned a ton, especially what the problem matchups were. Over the next two weeks, I work with Billa and my friends Yuki and Dylan to refine the team, obsessing over every little detail, every stat point, every Terra type. I was able to do this because Billa threw so many different matchups at me, letting me practice against teams I'd never even thought about. He even used a Walking Wake Sun team against me. More than just the variety of teams though, because Billa had identified what the hardest matchups were at his tournament, we were able to run games over and over and over again until I knew these problem matchups inside and out. They are still hard, but I just feel so much more prepared now knowing what I need to do to win. After two and a half weeks of rigorous testing, this is the final version of the team that I will bring to the Charlotte Regional Championships. Farigaraf. I nicknamed it Diamonds Please because of this meme. It's here to set up Trick Room, but unlike other Farigaraf, that is not enough. I also need it to do as much damage as possible afterwards. Spoilers, I bring Frigoraf to every single game this tournament except for two. It's the MVP of this team as well as the starting point. Protect keeps it alive, Trick Room sets up Trick Room, Piper Voice hits both opponents and activates the Throat Spray, and Psychic is the strongest Psychic move it gets. A Terra type of Fairy allows it to beat Urshifu Dark. It's trained to survive Choice Specs Terra Fairy Moonblast from Fluttermane and Terra Water Surging Strikes from Urshifu. You might notice it's got a weird speed stat. Frigoraf without any speed investment hits 80 speed stat, so why is mine 78? Well, I wanted Frigoraf to always be slower than other Incineroar, who also happens to be 80 speed stat, because in Trick Room, I want to be able to use Hyper Voice before I get hit with Knock Off, which not only ensures that I get the special attack boost, but it also reduces the damage by using up my item. It's a cheeky two for one bargain. Okay, but then why not be 79 speed stat? Well, to understand that, we first need to talk about everyone's favorite heal, Incineroar. Incineroar is nicknamed Don't Look At Me because while I do respect him, I don't like him. His moveset brings out its full potential. Fake Out and Parting Shot are the most broken supporting moves that it gets, Flare Blitz is a great way to do damage, and Knock Off removes the item from key threats in addition to being a powerful dark type move. The most common item on Incineroar is Citrus Berry, but I want more insurance against Amoongus, so I'll go with Safety Goggles. With Safety Goggles, two Grass-type Pokemon, and Terra Grass Fluttermane, my team is so good at into Spore and Sleep Powder that no Pokemon on my team ever fell asleep during the tournament. Incineroar is trained to survive Choice Specs Terra Fairy Fluttermane Moonblast and to make sure that Chen Pao's Sacred Sword takes three hits to KO after Intimidate. Normally, Incineroar uses Terra Dragon or Terra Grass to resist water moves, plus some other useful types, but I decide to use Terra Ghost instead. In practice, I just was never using Terra Dragon, like ever, because my team is already so tanky, and Terra Ghost allows me to do a neat thing where, even though I was almost always slower than my opponent's Fake Out users, I could use Terra Ghost to become immune to their Fake Out, giving me an edge. Oh yeah, Incineroar's speed stat. Without any investment, Incineroar hits 80 speed stats, so why is mine 77? Well, I want Incineroar to be exactly one point slower than Ferrigraph. This is so under Trick Room, I can knock off before Ferrigraph attacks, removing items like Citrus Berry and Assault Vest to combo for maximum damage. Now, normally, you want your Fake Out users to be faster than your opponent's Fake Out users so that you can use Fake Out first. This is especially useful when leading something like Incineroar Fluttermane, where you can Fake Out their partner while your partner is immune. With Armor Tail, however, I don't need to worry about this, because Fake Out is a priority move, it doesn't work when the Giraffe is on the field. Now, Incineroar could, in theory, be even slower. But the reason I want Incineroar to be exactly one point slower than Ferrigarath is because of a niche little mechanic. See, abilities activate in the order of how fast a Pokemon is. So by leading Incineroar into a battle and checking whether my Intimidate activated before or after my opponent's abilities like pouring onto his download or opposing Incineroar's Intimidate, I can immediately know whether Frigarath is faster than my opponent's Pokemon, which tells me whether setting Trick Room up will help or hurt me. I can also check speeds the manual way by just letting Incineroar attack to get the same information against Pokemon with ambiguous speed stats. 
Okay, but that still doesn't explain why the speeds are 77 and 78 stat instead of 78 and 79. If anyone guesses this off the top of their heads, you deserve a sweet treat. The reason is because of this stupid smug genie. Tornadus' signature move, Bleak Wind Storm, has a chance to drop both of your Pokemon's speed stats. And if that happens to Furgraph and Incineroar, things can get messy. If Incineroar is 78 speed and Furigraph is 79 speed, after a speed drop, they both end up being 52 speed stat. A speed tie. Imagine losing the tournament because at minus one speed, your Furigraph moved before Incineroar could knock off a crucial assault vest. So I went with 77 and 78 speed stats so that even if Tornadus hit the lottery, my Pokemon would still move in the order I wanted. Next up, Rillaboom, nicknamed Fern. Rillaboom is a grass type, and the Rillaboom I happened to catch had the title The Stern, so Fern the Stern. Big up for support, Grassy Glide for priority, Wood Hammer for damage, U-turn for pivoting. It's EV trained to have a good chance to survive Landorus Incarnate, Terra Poison, Sludge Bomb with Life Orb, and Sheer Force, which is kind of nutty, with enough attack to still do lots of damage. Generally, I think a Terra type of Fire is best on Rillaboom since it prevents burns and gives you a resistance to Fire type attacks. On my team though, I was having a lot of trouble with Glamora, and without a Poison type, I had no way of removing the Toxic Spikes that often got set up thanks to its ability. So I decided to use Terra Poison Rillaboom to give me at least one way of removing the Spikes. Urshifu Water, aka Slippery Dog, because, well, he's a Slippery Dog. It's pretty much entirely standard. Standard moveset and Terra type. I got the EV spread from Billa. It outspeeds Scarflander Asterion and still invests heavily in its offense while trying to survive certain key attacks. I spent most of my practice using no bulk, max speed, max attack Urshifu, but it kept getting knocked out by really silly attacks, so I eventually made it bulkier. Also, it kept missing out on knockouts that I thought it would get anyway, even with max attack, so I decided that I was okay dropping the attack a little bit and just assuming I'm not going to KO anything unless I terastalize. Even though Urshifu itself is extremely standard, it was actually really difficult to figure out how to use it well. I spent basically the entire week leading up to the tournament just working on figuring out how to actually make it feel like a broken Pokemon, because whenever I used it, uh, let's just say it didn't look very broken. Thanks to the effort I put in, I finally feel ready to use it and ruin my opponent's day as we approach the tournament itself. The penultimate member is Fluttermane, with Wolfie's special set, nicknamed Let's Slow Down because this Fluttermane takes a few turns to get going. You already know the reasoning behind why this Fluttermane is here. Protect, Calm Mind, Moonblast, and Shadow Ball allow Fluttermane to do the most damage while also setting up and staying safe. And Terra Grass turns off its weakness to steel while also making Fluttermane a Moongus proof. The EVs, in my humble opinion, are actually quite clever. I gave Fluttermane enough speed to outspeed Tornadus and Ogre Pawn, even if my speed was dropped, enough defense and HP to survive two Incineroar Flare Blitzes after an Intimidate, and enough special attack to one hit KO opposing Fluttermane with Shadow Ball after a Calm Mind. In a way, this Fluttermane was the ultimate Fluttermane counter. You're never KO'd by Shadow Ball after a Calm Mind, even if they're holding the choice specs, and you should almost always KO with your own Shadow Ball after that same boost. And with the speed boost, you're faster than every offensive set. Normally, Fluttermane versus Fluttermane comes down to which one is faster and who pulls the trigger with Terra, but with this set, I don't need to worry about any of that, which just leaves Ogre Pond, aka Step on the Gas self-explanatory nickname. You already know why I chose the moves I did, and I didn't have a choice with the Terra type. Ogre Pond's stats are just maxed out speed and attack. I spent almost all of my testing with this Pokemon with a little less power and a little more bulk, but going into the tournament, I realized I was weak to Furigraph paired with Blood Moon Ursaluna, and by maxing out my attack stat, I have a better chance to KO Furigraph and deny Trick Room. Ogre Pond has the ability Mold Breaker before it terastalizes, which allows it to ignore the abilities of other Pokemon, most notably Heatran, but also you can use Grassy Glide against opposing Fragraph, who would normally shut it down. That being said, I didn't realize this until after the tournament was already over, so it didn't help me personally, though it absolutely would have if I had realized. Whoopsie! And just like that, the team is complete. I feel really good going into the tournament. Not that I expect to win, but I feel like this team checks so many of my boxes, and it is so difficult to play against. 
every single Pokemon on the team can take advantage of fake out support. And I have three different setup Pokemon I think are really strong that most of my opponents won't have even seen before. On top of all of that, this team makes me feel so in control of battles. With so many different ways to move before my opponent and not a single move present that can miss, I really feel like my fate is in my own hands. The team is definitely good enough. Now I just need to prove it. Before I know it, tournament weekend is here. I thank my friends for helping me prepare and despite some inclement weather, make it to Charlotte. My friends and I go to a nice dinner the night before the event where I try oyster for the first time. And okay, listen, like it might just be because I've been a vegetarian for eight years and only recently started eating fish again, but what? That little guy was not good. Maybe because it was foamed, but like I I've heard people talk about oysters for years and I'm like, oh, they must be delicious. Too bad I can't have one. And then I eat one and I uh, uh, uh. But the problem is my friends are now convinced that eating the oyster gave me good luck and are pressuring me to eat one before every tournament. So that's something I'm gonna have to deal with. Anyway, the next morning I get up bright and early, go on a hunt for a banana, head to the venue and sit down to play my first match. Today is the first phase of the tournament. If I wanna make it to phase two, I need to win seven out of my nine matches. But winning seven rounds isn't my goal. I wanna win eight because the second phase of the tournament carries over all wins and all losses from today. The judges tell us we can begin round one and I take a look at my opponent's team. It's a team built around Indeedee and Iron Crown with Tornadus, Chiyu, Walking Wake, and Fluttermane. I get this weird sense of deja vu and I realize something. Last year at Charlotte Regionals, I played a team built around Psychic Terrain round one as well and I lost. This is my chance at redemption. The battle starts with Ndidi and Walking Wake against my Ferrigraph and Urshifu. By using U-Turn, I can pivot my Pokemon around while chipping down my opponent, and immediately I'm able to show off the strength of my team. Ndidi's Psychic Terrain shuts down all priority moves, but I can overwrite it with Rillaboom's Grassy Terrain, giving me access to Fake Out once again. I use Rillaboom to help Ferrigraph set Trick Room up and sacrifice the monkey to take out the Chi Yu and get a special attack boost while they switch Ndidi out. My opponent brings Ndidi back in to reverse Trick Room, but by activating Psychic Terrain, they've inadvertently boosted the power of Ferrigraph Psychic, and I take out Walking Wake in a single hit. Left with just Fluttermane and Ndidi, I set Trick Room up once more and win the game. But that doesn't mean round one is over. Every match this tournament is best two out of three, so I need to win one more game if I want to take the set. My opponent realizes that giving up Psychic Terrain right away isn't going to work, so they switch their leads up, this time using Chiyu and Fluttermane to immediately threaten my Pokemon. But I've decided to switch things up too. Their team is six special attackers, and you know who's good against special attackers? Calm Mind Fluttermane. My Fluttermane and Incineroar lead spooks my opponent, and they immediately switch their Fluttermane into Ndidi to try and stop a fake out. But I decide to play it slow, protecting Flutter, tanking a Heat Wave with Incineroar, and lowering Chiyu's special attack with a parting shot, allowing me to switch in Rillaboom safely and immediately get rid of the terrain. With fake out pressure and a drop on Chiyu, I can set up a Calm Mind safely, and that basically seals the game. Fluttermane uses Chiyu's Beads of Ruin ability against it, as it weakens its own team special defense stats, letting Moonblast pick off the Pokemon one by one, while I use Fake Out to keep the Chiyu in gay baby jail. In the end, I win the game without losing a single Pokemon. It's a great start, but I still have a long day ahead of me. And the second round is against one of the more problematic matchups. My opponent has the team that won the first regional championship of the new format. And the combination of specifically Ogre Pond Wellspring and Assault Vest Entei is a little bit tricky for my team, since with half my Pokemon being Fire or Grass, it's kind of hard to hit Entei, and Fluttermane has a losing matchup against it too. If I'm going to win, I need to use Urshifu to its maximum potential. The battle starts with Ogre Pond and Entei against my Urshifu and Fluttermane. I make the play I practiced. U-turn and Moonblast into the Ogre Pond to get the KO. And I think things are going to go well because I baited out the Terra Grass from the Entei. But to my utter disbelief, Ogre Pond survives with like one HP. I bring in Incineroar who promptly takes an Ivy Cudgel because the Ogre Pond survived. And Sacred Fire nearly one hit KOs my Fluttermane. Now I've nearly lost two Pokemon in a single turn. I bring Urshifu back out and Entei goes for a Snarl, thinking it'll KO Flutter, but I barely survive, as Ogre Pond blocks my Moonblast with Spiky Shield. 
and now I see a way I can get back into this. Even though my Urshifu is Choice Scarf, because of the booster energy, my Flutter main is still faster. So I use Flutter to finish off the low HP Ogre Pawn, eliminating the threat of Follow Me. And you turn into the Grass type Entei, and I get a critical hit. Entei is left with like 30% as I bring in Incineroar and Entei KOs Flutter main. My opponent sends out Raging Bolt, but Fake Out is active, and I stop her from attacking while Urshifu KOs Entei, forcing my opponent into their final Pokemon, Flutter main. Now, this looks kind of bad. Raging Bolt has the priority move Thunderclap, which will KO my Urshifu, and Flutter main can finish off the low HP Incineroar. But don't forget about the Giraffe. Even though I don't want to set Trick Room up, I can still use Armor Tail to save Urshifu. Incineroar switches to Fragorath, Raging Bolt's Thunderclap is blocked by Armor Tail, and Urshifu KOs Flutter Main. Up 3 against 1, I win the game. My opponent switches things up for game 2, leading with Dragonite and Chen Pao into my Urshifu and Entei. I use U-Turn and Parting Shot to reposition carefully, then knock both my opponents out with a sneaky Hyper Voice on turn 2, as they predict me to go for Trick Room. This time, they brought Flutter Main and Ogre Pawn in the back, and I sacrificed my Flutter Main to get my Urshifu in, forcing them to target it as I set Trick Room up, letting me clean up with Fragoraf and Incineroar. I win the set putting me at a record of two wins and zero losses. The third round is yet another different archetype, this time featuring Gouging Fire, Metagross, and Raging Bolt. The general idea is that Gouging Fire is really fast with speed booster energy, and it can use Howl to raise both it and Metagross's attack stats. And thanks to Metagross's clear body ability, you can't use Intimidate to get rid of these boosts. And Metagross is really tanky with the Assault Vest item. It's a really scary strategy. I have a trick up my sleeve, but in order to understand it, we have to talk about Ogre Pawn. Let's talk through the game one leads. Gouging Fire and Ogre Pawn Wellspring against Incineroar and Ogre Pawn Hearth Flame. Now, normally in front of Fake Out pressure, most people like to protect with both of their Pokemon. Since Fake Out only works in the first turn, this is a great way to nullify it. However, my Ogre Pawn has Swords Dance, and getting a Swords Dance off for free in front of a Double Protect is pretty much a game-winning play on the first turn. So, in front of Swords Dance Ogre Pawn paired with Fake Out, most people feel the need to never protect for fear of the Swords Dance, and I can use that to my advantage with Wolfie's special trick. Knowing that my opponents aren't going to protect, I can step on the gas and Fake Out the faster Pokemon while Terastalizing to Fire and KOing the slower Pokemon, immediately gaining huge ground. And that's exactly what I do here. With such a huge lead, I easily close out the game. But game two is much more difficult. I switch to my Flutter main mode and I get off to a strong start, but for the first time ever, the opponent's Flutter main survives a plus one Shadow Ball, something that has never happened before or after. Even assuming the Flutter main had maximum HP, the odds of this KOing are over 50%. Not picking up the KO completely swings the game and I lose. I'm going to my first game three of the day. I've used my Ogre Pawn mode, I've used my Flutter main mode. Let's try out the Ferrigraph mode. I've been leaving Rillaboom behind, but I bring it for the first time all set. And after how threatening Ogre Pawn was game one, my opponent decides to leave behind their Metagross giving them almost no Pokemon that can take a Wood Hammer. I combine Ferrigraph with both Trick Room attackers and output huge amounts of damage, taking home the win in Game 3. I feel really good about closing out that set, but I start to feel a little nervous when I see my next opponent's team. It's the Arcaladon Rain matchup that caused me so much trouble before I changed my Flutter main. My strategy to beat it had worked in practice, but would it work now when it really counted? In Game 1, I bring an Urshifu earlier than my opponent expected, and even though it was just a bluff as I immediately U-turn out again, it forces my opponent to play defensive, wasting their Terra, switching Incineroar into Pelipper, and crucially, ignoring Fluttermane for the single turn I need to get a Calm Mind up. With my Fluttermane set up and my opponent out of position, I KO Pelipper and use my Fake Out Core to keep the pressure up with Fluttermane, winning game one. But now my opponent knows what I'm going for. Will it work a second time? They switch up their lead, starting with Pelipper and Arcaladon from the get-go. Fake Out Calm Mind is a good turn one for me, as they set up Tailwind. And I realize that with Tailwind up, they're going to expect me to play defensive. I instead use Rillaboom's Priority Grassy Glide to break Pelipper's Focus Ash, and then KO it with Moonblast before it can attack. 
even with tailwind speed booster fluttermane is faster than pelipper my opponent scrambles to reposition but i have so much more experience in the matchup than they do and i nail our caladon with knockoff removing its assault vest and decreasing its special defense by 50 percent in the same turn i get a second calm mind with terra grass fluttermane ignoring amoongus's rage powder i ko our caladon in a single hit winning me the game it feels great to win in a matchup that used to be so problematic but i can't take a break my next opponent is a friend of mine and a regional champion and they have a very strange but somehow familiar team walking wake torkoal sun this is a very unorthodox team and i wouldn't have played against it at all in practice except for my friend billa billa helped me practice using the same archetype and even though there are some key differences i know what pokemon i need to bring and what my general win conditions are you see there's a very niche mechanic that i didn't even know about until billa and i started practicing this matchup to understand it we need to talk about fluttermane Fluttermane holds the booster energy item, which gives it a stat boost depending on what its highest stat is the first time it hits the field. My Fluttermane's highest stat is speed, so it gets a speed boost. If the harsh sunlight is up, the ability activates. And actually, the sun takes priority over the booster energy, so if sun is up, the booster energy won't activate. But on my specific Fluttermane, something strange can happen. I send Fluttermane out when the sun is up preserving my booster energy, and I use my support Pokemon to get a Calm Mind boost. Then the battle plays out as normal, but Fluttermane doesn't go down. Eventually, the harsh sunlight fades, which means my booster energy activates. But because I used Calm Mind, speed is no longer my highest stat. It's instead special attack. And so under this extremely specific set of circumstances, I can use a Fluttermane that has both the special attack boost from Calm Mind and the special attack boost from the booster energy. And my Fluttermane is the fastest Pokemon in the matchup. I only learned about this mechanic because of my practice against Billa, and I use it to my advantage to get KOs I normally wouldn't be able to, letting me win game one. Game two starts off super strong for me, but I make a pretty massive blunder and fail to recover, sending us into game three. It's a really close game as I KO Incineroar turn one, but end up in trouble against Raging Bolt and Torkoal. In the end, it comes down to my Fluttermane with about 50 HP and a Calm Mind boost, plus my low HP Incineroar against Walking Wake with some damage and full HP Torkoal in the sun. I predict that Shadow Ball will KO Walking Wake and that it isn't going to protect. And I get it right, Walking Wake goes down. But the problem is even with the special defense boost, Fluttermane will still get KO'd by Overheat. And Incineroar is then going to lose the one against one versus Torkoal. So I need Overheat to miss, a 10% chance. But I hate relying on luck to save me, so I find a different out. I use Incineroar's Parting Shot on Torkoal. And even though I can't switch as I have no other Pokemon left, I still get the special attack drop. And with both the special attack drop from Parting Shot and the special defense boost from Calm Mind, Fluttermane barely survives, winning me the set and putting me at a record of five wins and zero losses. I am, as the kids say, pogging out. If I can just win two more sets, I'll advance to the second day, but I should still take it one game at a time. My next opponent has a team that I know can be very difficult, a team built around Glamora. But this opponent played my friend Brendan earlier in the day, so I know going in what they're using. Plus, Brendan told me about some tendencies he'd noticed in their play. Armed with information, I head to my seat and begin the set. In game one, I focus on my Trick Room mode, using Rillaboom and Fragoraph to get set up. I get a crucial turn correct, as my opponent predicts me to protect Fragoraph and targets my Rillaboom with Sludge Bomb, as I instead go for a Hyper Voice to do some damage and get the Throat Spray online, and to rastalize Rillaboom to poison, surviving the Sludge Bomb. With that one free turn, my lead is enormous, and I blow through my opponent's team with Fragoraph and Rillaboom. I decide to lead with Urshifu and Rillaboom in game two to try and immediately threaten a fake out into Ogre Pond and a Surging Strikes play into the Glamora. But my opponent leads with Chi Yu and Glamora, two Pokemon who are both KO'd by Surging Strikes. Now, obviously, they could just switch an Ogre Pond and Terra Grass with Glamora to make both Pokemon good into Surging Strikes, but Brendan told me they'd played really risky in front of his Surging Strikes Urshifu, so I decide to not overthink things. I Surging Strikes the Chi Yu as it stays in and gets KO'd, and would hammer the Glamora dropping it to low HP. My opponent sends out Fluttermane, and I realize they must not have Ogre Pond in the back. 
I am choice locked into Surging Strike, so if they do have it, it would make a lot of sense to bring it out here. In other words, I'm free to just Surging Strikes again. They protect Fluttermane, as Grassy Glide KOs Glamora and Surging Strikes KOs Fluttermane, putting me in the lead four against one in just two turns. My opponent sends out their final Pokemon, and it's Ogre Pond. They forfeit, and I advance to six wins and zero losses. Now just one win away from advancing to the second day, my next match is selected for the stream. I'm going up against the player who eliminated me from Charlotte Regionals last year and eliminated me from Nationals to boot, so I'm pretty nervous. And he has a very unusual team. Oregon 2, Hatterini, huh? No indeedy? I don't have any experience against this type of team, but at the same time, it really doesn't look like a bad matchup. Am I missing something? I lead off with Incineroar and Ferrigraph against Incineroar and Porygon 2. And thanks to the order of the abilities activating, I can see that the opponent's Incineroar and Porygon 2 are faster than my Incineroar and Ferrigraph. So Trick Room going up benefits me. Unfortunately, Porygon 2 traces Armor Tail, so the fake out Hyper Voice play I'd been thinking about making is off the table. Now, my Furgraph is under a lot of pressure here. Knock Off would do over half its health and remove the Throat Spray, but I just have this feeling that my opponent wants to go for Parting Shot and Trick Room to get Ursaluna in. It's a really specific play, but I feel in my heart that that's what's going to happen. So I decide to cover only that play. If my opponent does anything else, I'll be in huge trouble. The turn starts and my opponent's Incineroar, being faster than mine, uses Parting Shot before I can attack, and brings in Ursaluna. Hyper Voice goes off, but more importantly than the little chip damage I do, my knockoff hits Ursaluna, removing its Flame Orb item. Flame Orb burns Ursaluna at the end of the turn, activating its Guts ability, which powers up all its moves by 50%, and doubling the power of its Facade attack on top of that. By removing its item, I've just cut its damage output by a ton. Porygon 2 sets up Trick Room, but without a burn on Ursaluna, this is way less of a big deal. Now, I don't really want my Incineroar to take an Earthquake, but I just don't feel like my opponent wants to go for that. He ends up switching out both Ursaluna and Porygon 2 into Incineroar and... What's that music? Oh my god, not again! I go for Parting Shot and reverse the Trick Room, letting me bring in my Ogre Pawn. Boldengo protects, blocking the Ivy Cudgel, and Incineroar Parting Shot's Ogre Pawn, bringing Porygon 2 back in. But I predicted the Parting Shot and went for a Psychic into the Dark-type Incineroar, doing some crucial damage to Porygon 2. Next turn, I step on the gas, Terrastalizing Ogre Pawn as my opponent Terrastalizes Goldengo to Fairy. Porygon 2 barely survives the Ivy Cudgel, and Goldengo sets up a nasty plot. But Ferrigraph KOs the Porygon 2 just barely thanks to the extra damage Psychic did, giving me a Pokemon advantage. Incineroar is sent out, and I switch my own Incineroar in as my opponent KOs Ferrigraph. But it's more than done its job. I bring Ogre Pawn out once more and use Fake Out to set up a Swords Dance. And now there's no stopping Ogre Pond. My opponent makes some great defensive plays, but my offense is just way too much. And I completely shut down my opponent's attempt to do some damage with Ursaluna by parting shotting and bringing in Rillaboom, cutting Earthquake's power to a third of what it would have been otherwise. Ogre Pond cleans up the game, putting me one game away from advancing to day two. Now, even though Ogre Pond was the MVP in that game, and even though my opponent doesn't really have any clear answers to it, I decide to leave it behind in game two. I think based on how strong Ogre Pond was, that there's basically no chance my opponent brings a Moongus. And so, leading with Urshifu and using it to apply pressure could catch them totally off guard. Now, I don't generally recommend leaving behind your star Pokemon going into game two, but right now it just feels like the right play. Game two starts with the same lead of Porygon 2 and Incineroar from my opponent against my Urshifu and Ferrigaraph. And just like the last game, I decide to make a hard read on turn one. If my guess is correct, my opponent has Goldengo and Ursaluna in the back, aka nothing that can take surging strikes. If that's true, the only way that they can really think to stop Urshifu is to terrestrialize Incineroar to Dragon, go for a Trick Room and Parting Shot to bring in Ursaluna and get the Flame Orb activated right away, preventing me from hitting it with Knock Off this time. Again, this is an extremely specific play, and if I'm wrong about what Pokemon my opponent has brought or the play that they want to go for, I could lose a ton of ground from the get-go, and I know that, but I still feel like they're going to make this one specific play, so that's what I'm going to commit to. The turn starts with a Terra from Incineroar, turning into the Dragon type. I did Surging Strikes into that slot, but thanks to the Terra, the attack does basically no damage. Incineroar uses Parting Shot and brings in Ursaluna. 
but my extremely specific hard read ended up being dead right. Porygon 2 uses Trick Room to twist the dimensions, but Furigraph uses Trick Room in the same turn, putting things right back to normal. If I'd gotten this turn wrong, it would have been game losing, as I'd have given my opponent Trick Room for free. But now, Ursaluna is on the field and still exposed against Urshifu, and Terra is no longer on the table. Now, the obvious play here from my opponent is to switch Ursaluna back into Incineroar and Trick Room with Porygon 2. And even though there isn't really a drawback to my opponent making that play, I don't really want to make another hard read here. See, I just made an extremely specific read on my opponent's play, and I got it right. It can be super disorienting when this happens to you, and it can cause players to make mistakes. Thinking, well, they just hard read a really specific play, so maybe I should just do the most obvious move and they'll overthink it. So I decide to keep my opponent honest. Purigraph is at minus one special attack after the parting shot, and it already bought me some time with that turn one trick room. So I switch into Rillaboom to get fake out pressure. But the Pokemon that switches out on my opponent's end isn't Ursaluna, but Porygon 2. I Terrastalize Urshifu to water and launch a Surging Strikes into Ursaluna, picking up a one hit KO and removing the biggest threat to my team. Porygon 2 comes back out, and I take half its health with fake out and Surging Strikes. Incineroar's Flare Blitz doesn't KO Rillaboom, but it does get the burn. Unfortunately, this is way too little too late. Urshifu can't be stopped at this point, and after a few more turns, my opponent forfeits. I win the set and find myself with 7 wins and 0 losses, with a guaranteed spot in the second day of the tournament. I am so happy to be guaranteed moving on to the second day at my first tournament back in over 4 months. But the first day is far from over. Normally, the way these tournaments work is you play 9 rounds day 1, 5 rounds day 2, and at the end, anybody who has lost 2 or fewer sets advances, and a few people who have lost 3 sets make it in as well. However, because this is the largest official tournament of all time, there is an extra round tomorrow. But the number of games you can afford to lose is the same. In other words, you can only afford two losses out of 15 rounds. So every round I win today means a little more breathing room tomorrow. The round eight pairings go up and I sit down to play against another Pokemon I haven't seen yet today, Dendozo. It's paired with Chen Pao and Dragonite, but my matchup isn't that bad because Incineroar is so powerful against the big fish and Farigraph makes Dragonite very sad. I navigate to a good position in the first game, dealing some early damage and forcing Dendozo in and I think I'm equipped to handle it, but then I get a critical hit and it just faints, winning me the game almost instantly. Game two, my opponent leads with Chen Pao and Dragonite against my Incineroar and Fragoraph. I look at the team sheet and I notice that Dragonite doesn't have a flying move. I'm like pretty sure that Chen Pao is gonna use Sacred Sword here into Incineroar, so switching Incineroar into Fluttermane feels pretty safe since there's no risk I get KO'd without Dragonite having a flying move. This lets me save Intimidate for Dendozo later, which can be a big deal. I bring in Fluttermane, take no damage from Sacred Sword, and get dropped to 1 HP from Aerial Ace? The team sheet says Dragonite doesn't have a flying move. I call a judge over and they tell us to finish the game, but at this point the set is over because a team sheet error is an automatic game loss. I KO both Chen Pao and Dragonite on turn 2, and then use Rillaboom to set up Trick Room against Dendozo. I'm in a good spot to win once again, and I probably was going to win anyway, but then I crit the Dendozo, winning me the game again. The judges tell us that because of the team sheet error, the third game is ruled in my favor as well. So I somehow won the set three wins to zero, which I think is pretty funny. Oh, and just so we're clear, this 100% wasn't like malicious or anything. People make these kinds of errors somewhat often. I'm just glad it didn't end up affecting the set, and I feel great moving into the final round of the day with a record of eight wins and zero losses. My final opponent of the day is Nicholas Donnelly, a local player from my area, and my heart sinks as I see what he's using. Farigraph and Blood Moon Ursaluna. See, Blood Moon Ursaluna has this stupid ability that lets normal moves hit ghost types. And my only normal resistance is Fluttermane, which doesn't work against this messed up bear. And by pairing it with Farigraph, Fake Out, Grassy Glide, and Aqua Jet are all shut down as well. Blood Moon Ursaluna can be fast or slow, and I won't know which it is until it's already too late. And that means that I have no idea if I want to set Trick Room against it or not. On top of all of this, the Frigoraph has both Imprison and Trick Room, which can prevent me from either setting it up or reversing it depending on the situation. And all of that is not even mentioning Urshifu Dark, who can one-hit KO my Frigoraph, Tornadus, who can set Tailwind, Ogre Upon Hearthflame with Follow Me, and Clear Amulet Iron Hands, who's immune to Intimidate. 
This is an absolute nightmare matchup. Game one begins with both of us leading Farigarath and Ogre Pawn Hearthflame. I tested this matchup with Yuki a bunch, and when we played, he would oftentimes go for Follow Me and Trick Room here to prevent a turn one Terra Fire Ivy Cudgel from KOing his Farigarath too quickly. This turn one play was mirrored by the random opponents I played in testing. To counter this play, I decided to go for non-Terra Ivy Cudgel and Hyper Voice to set up for a big turn 2 double attack where I can hopefully KO both opponents. It's great in theory, but it does not work here, as Nick terrestrializes his Ogre Pond to fire and one hit KOs my Frigoraph while setting up Trick Room. With Frigoraph down, Blood Moon Ursa Luna can come in safely, and I lose the game extremely quickly in my fastest defeat of the day. And then my game crashes. I don't know what happened with the DLC, but this tournament had by far the most technical issues for me of any tournament I've ever entered. My game was laggy beyond belief trying to set battles up, there were disconnection issues, and right now my game just crashed. When I go to boot back in, I get a notice that the game needs to check for corrupted data, a check that takes almost 10 minutes. When it's done, I try and boot up again and the game crashes again, causing us to have to wait another 10 minutes while the corrupted data check goes through. Having this happen in the middle of a tense set was really distracting, but eventually my game starts working again and we're able to start game two. This time I'll do Frigoraf and Urshifu with Incineroar and Rillaboom in the back. Nick leads with Tornadus and Blood Moon Ursaluna, which is a much better lead for me than last game. If he's leading with Ursaluna and Tornadus, the Ursaluna has probably got a lot of speed. I think that Trick Room will favor me. Nick is forced to switch his Ursaluna out turn one, and he brings in his Urshifu and clicks Tailwind. But my close combat and Trick Room play is the absolute best thing I could have done. With such a huge lead, I use Ferragraph to start blasting damage and easily sweep through the rest of Nick's team. And as a bonus, before the battle ends, I'm able to confirm that his Ursaluna is in fact faster than my Furgaraf. Going into game three, I feel I have a much better plan. But game two, the leads were heavily in my favor and Nick's gonna adjust. I stick with Urshifu and Furgaraf in case he goes back to the game one leads, but Nick instead leads off with Ogre Pawn and Tornadus. Now there's two plays that Nick can make here, Tailwind and Woodhammer into Urshifu if he predicts Frigoraf to protect, or doubling into Frigoraf if he expects Urshifu to switch into Incineroar and me to go for a Trick Room. I decide to protect Frigoraf, and Nick terrestrializes Ogre Pond to fire. I'm expecting it to be Bleak Wind Storm, but instead Tailwind comes out. But instead of KOing Urshifu, Ogre Pond attacks into Frigoraf's Protect. U-Turn brings out Incineroar, letting me go for Fake Out and Trick Room on the next turn. With Trick Room up safely and Ferragraph in position, I'm poised to do a ton of damage. And though Nick does manage to survive the Trick Room, he doesn't have enough health left to prevent me from cleaning up with Urshifu. I win the game and somehow end the day with nine wins and zero losses. One of only two undefeated players in the entire tournament. Whew, talk about a first tournament back, huh? Seems like the break was pretty good for me, but I'm not out of the woods yet. The tournament at this point features only players with two losses or fewer meaning every round from here on out is going to be extremely tough. Still, it's a big accomplishment to go undefeated on the first day of the biggest tournament ever. And what's more, I did it playing nine completely different matchups. People love to complain like, oh, everybody in Pokemon just uses the same Pokemon. But uh, let me tell you, didn't really experience that today. With the day finally over, I grab some food with my friends, shower and hit the hay. The next morning, we need to be back once again bright and early something I'm not especially thrilled about after a poor night's sleep. After a quick detour to grab a banana, I head to the venue and sit down to play my round 10 match against the only other undefeated person left in the tournament. I'm actually not going to go into details on this set because after I won game one, there was a very unfortunate disconnect during game two um, that just made the whole thing a lot messier than it needed to be and kind of affected how things played out. But in the end, I ended up winning the set anyway, so ultimately no harm, no foul. With 10 wins and zero losses, I am now the only player left in the tournament who has not lost a single set. There are five more rounds today, and if I lose three of them, I could still miss out on the final eight person bracket. My round 11 matchup is a very unusual team, featuring Iron Crown, Ndidi, Tornadus, and Choice Band Urshifu Rapid Strike. In game one, Tornadus and Urshifu stare down my Furigarath and Ogre Pond. Now, Tornadus is threatening Tailwind, which would let Urshifu KO either Pokemon. I could switch in Rillaboom to give my Grassy Glide priority, but if they switch in Ndidi, they can just shut down the Grassy Terrain and remove my priority. 
But the reason why I led Foragraph has to do not with its ability, but with its speed stat. Just like abilities, switches happen in turn order. And because Foragraph is slower than all of my opponent's Pokemon, I can ensure that I always have the slowest switch. The battle begins and I switch Foragraph into Rillaboom, giving me guaranteed grassy terrain. I terrestrialize Ogre Hunt to fire, Urshavu terrestrializes to water, Tornada sets Tailwind, and Priority Grassy Glide KOs Urshavu before it can move. They send out Iron Crown and switch to Ndidi as I switch Rillaboom to Incineroar, but Expanding Force fails to KO Ogre Pond, and I KO the Iron Crown in one shot in return. With only Ndidi and Tornadus left, my opponent doesn't have enough offense, and I win the game. Game 2, my opponent adjusts and leads off with Ndidi and Choice Band Urshifu against my Ogre Pond and Foragraph. I decide to make a prediction. Ogre Pond caused them so much trouble last game, I feel like they're going to target it right away. And I don't think Urshifu is going to terrestrialize after terrestrialization did nothing last game. I terrestrialize Ogre Pond to fire and Ndidi uses follow me. But because my Ogre Pond is max attack, it is impossible for Ndidi to survive the Terra Fire Ivy Cudgel. Urshifu follows up by KOing my Ogre Pond, but I didn't go for Trick Room with Fragoraph. I went for Psychic. With the Psychic Terrain boosting its power, I get the one hit KO on Urshifu. And suddenly, I'm up three against two. I bring in Rillaboom, set Trick Room up, and win the game. I am now 11 wins and zero losses. Two more wins and I'm guaranteed to make the final bracket. But my next opponent is going to make that 12th win very difficult. It's Nick Donnelly once again. See, even though we've already played this tournament, each different phase resets your pool of opponents. Winning this matchup even once was really difficult, but having to do it again after I've already showed off a bunch of my tricks, it's going to be even harder. Nick is 10 wins and one loss meaning the only set he's lost this entire tournament is to me. Unlike our last set though, this one will be on stream, adding to the pressure. There is not much time to prepare, so I decide to use the same strategy that worked last time. Urshifu and Foragraph up front, with Incineroar and Rillaboom in the back. The leads are the same as Game 3 from last time, with Torn and Ogre Pond facing down Foragraph and Urshifu. Last time, I went for Protect with Foragraph and Attack with Urshifu, so I'm going to predict Nick will counter that play. It's super risky, as a double attack into my Foragraph could knock it out but I think this is going to work. I switch Urshavu to Incineroar as Nick goes for Tailwind and wood hammers into that slot, and Foragraph gets Trick Room up for free. I go for Fake Out and Hyper Voice on the second turn, but unlike last set, Nick brought Foragraph in the back, using Armor Tail to stop Fake Out, though I do still manage to get my Throat Spray online. I KO Foragraph and drop Tornadus to low HP, and Nick sends out Ursaluna. I could just go for the safe play of Hyper Voice and Flare Blitz into Ursaluna, but I feel like Nick is going to play defensive with Tornadus, so I make a hard read. Nick switches Tornadus out as his Ursaluna terrestrializes to normal, but I ignored the Tornadus, instead attacking with both my Pokemon into Ursaluna, knocking it out before it can attack. Up four against two, I win the game, but Nick adjusts for game two, bringing a Pokemon I haven't seen since the very first game of our very first set, the clear amulet Iron Hands. I have Foragraph and Urshifu against it, but the problem is that the Foragraph has Helping Hand, and I'm pretty sure Helping Hand Close Combat can KO my Foragraph. I'm also pretty confident I'll survive a wild charge with Urshifu though, so I decide to make what I think is a safe play, terrestrializing to water with Urshifu, but Nick terrestrializes his Iron Hands to Grass a play I truthfully hadn't even considered. The turn goes as poorly as possible, as I protect Foragraph and Nick ignores it, using Helping Hand Close Combat to KO Urshifu in one hit and taking negligible damage from the Terra Water Surging Strikes. Now I've lost my Terra and I barely did any damage. Plus, my Foragraph is exposed having just protected. At this point, I feel like the battle is over, because in the first game we played, I saw that Nick's Iron Hands outsped my Incineroar, meaning it's most likely faster than my Foragraph too. And that means there's nothing I can do to stop Helping Hand close combat. I send in Rillaboom and hope for a mistake, but the turn starts out with Helping Hand, meaning Nick is probably taking a KO. To my shock, Foragraph outspeeds Iron Hands and KOs it with Hyper Voice. That means either Incineroar is speed tying Iron Hands or Foragraph is. Nick sends out Urshifu and I need to make a call. I predict that Nick isn't going to target Foragraph, but instead go for Helping Hand Wicked Blow into Rillaboom. 
but I get scared at the last second and decide to leave Rillaboom in instead of fully committing to the play by switching to Incineroar. Rillaboom goes down, and even though Trick Room went up, I'm in a bad spot down two against three. This is frustrating because I got most of the way there, but I just didn't follow through, and actually the play that I made will end up losing me the game pretty much no matter which option Nick picks. It's just a really silly error to make. I take out the Urshifu, but Nyx Foragraph reverses the Trick Room, and Blood Moon Ursaluna comes in. It KOs Incineroar with Helping Hand Blood Moon, but I can still win this if Psychic KOs. I go for it, and Ursaluna drops low, but just barely survives. Nick goes for Helping Hand Hyper Voice, and I think it's over, but my Foragraph hangs on. Nick's Ursaluna faints to the recoil, and suddenly the battle is just Foragraph against Foragraph. Nick's Foragraph is faster, but its only damaging move is Dazzling Gleam. If I can survive, I'll win. Dazzling Gleam comes out and I faint. It looks like I had about an 18% chance to survive there, so it's not shocking that Foragraph went down. We're going to game three. Against this Iron Hands lead with Terra Grass, I don't think Urshavu is going to work. I think it over and in the limited time I have, decide to go back to my lead from the first game of our set, Foragraph and Ogre Pawn. This time though, I'll bring Incineroar and Urshavu in the back instead of Incineroar and Rillaboom. But Nick changes things up once again. Even though Iron Hands was so good last game, he leaves it out of the lead in favor of the new Ogre Pawn and Blood Moon lead. On the first turn of the battle, both Ogre Pawn terrestrialize. I protect Foragraph and Ivy Cudgel the Blood Moon, but it just barely survives. Nick uses Ogre Pawn to attack into Foragraph's Protect, but Blood Moon KOs my Ogre Pawn, taking out my Terrastal Pokemon right away, though it does faint to the Life Orb recoil in return. The thing is, this knockout isn't as bad as it looks, as I send out Urshifu to join the battle and Nick sends out Foragraph. With Ogre Pawn now a pure fire type and slower than my Scarf Urshifu, Nick is forced to switch Ogre Pawn into Iron Hands to take a double up from Surging Strikes and Hyper Voice, as he sets Trick Room with Foragraph. And now I have a choice to make. I can protect Foragraph, keeping it safe from Helping Hand close combat, but is Iron Hands actually faster in Trick Room? It's either speed tying Incineroar or it's speed tying Foragraph. And if it's speed tying Foragraph, I have a 50% chance to move before it does and take it out. Also, Nick might go after Urshifu here, leaving my Foragraph safe to attack. With multiple ways that this turn works in my favor, I decide to do the simple thing and just attack with both my Pokemon. Nick goes for Helping Hand, and my heart sinks as I see Iron Hands go for close combat. But it targets Urshifu. It gets the KO, but Frigara fires back with a Hyper Voice, keeping the Pokemon score even at two apiece. Both fire types hit the field, and Incineroar gets a crucial Intimidate onto Ogre Pond. I try to lower Ogre Pond's attack one more stage with Parting Shot, but Nick goes for Spiky Shield, and my boosted Hyper Voice doesn't finish off Foragraph, who reverses its own Trick Room. And now it's a 50-50. Nick can go for Helping Hand Ivy Cudgel to KO Foragraph, or he can predict me to Protect and go for Follow Me to save his Foragraph for a single turn. I Protect. Nick goes for Helping Hand. Ogre Pond's huge attack is completely blocked by Protect, and I KO Foragraph with Incineroar, putting me up two to one. Thanks to Incineroar's Intimidate, Ogre Pond can't KO Foragraph in a single hit unless it gets a critical hit. And Ivy Cudgel crits one out of every eight times thanks to its heightened crit rate. There's nothing else I can do. I lock in Psychic and Knock Off and watch as Ivy Cudgel doesn't KO. Psychic drops Ogre Pond low and Knock Off finishes the job and I win the set putting me at a record of 12 wins and zero losses after another three games set with Nick. There's not much time before the next round starts. And this time I'm going up against an opponent with Glamora, Tornadus, and Chi Yu. Game one begins with Tornadus and Chi Yu against Ogre Pawn and Frigoraph. Both fire types terrestrialize to fire as Frigoraph protects and Tornadus uses Sunny Day. I Ivy Cudgel the Chi Yu, but to my shock, it survives. For context, this move should do about 133% to Chi Yu without any bulk, so this Chi Yu must be exceptionally bulky. In return, though, Chi Yu's Heat Wave doesn't KO Ogre Pawn. The game progresses with me KOing his Chi Yu, which he replaces with Glamora. I preserve Frigoraph and set Trick Room up at the perfect time and find myself in a spot to win the game. As long as my opponent doesn't get a double protect with both Glamora and Tornadus, I'll win. But wouldn't you know it, both Tornadus and Glamora land double protects, and somehow I go from a winning position to a losing one. I lose game one. 
I was a little surprised that my opponent went for the Chiyu and Tornadus lead, given that Incineroar and Fergrath would be a really positive matchup, so I decided to try it for game two. But my opponent switches to Chiyu and Glamora. Now, normally, Fergrath does survive Glamora's Meteor Beam, but with the Beads of Ruin, I'm actually not so sure. And I can't fake out the Glamora because Overheat would probably KO as well, thanks to the Choice Vex, and definitely if they go for Terra Fire. So I decided to switch, bringing in Urshifu for Incineroar and protecting as they target down Fergrath with both Pokemon. On the second turn, I launch a close combat to KO Chiyu, and Glamora's Sludge Bomb takes out Urshifu. But rather than go for Trick Room, I use Psychic to KO Glamora, putting me in the lead three against two. With Frigoroff still at full HP and Incineroar waiting in the wings, I win the game. Game three, my opponent once again leads with Chi Yu and Glamora, but I lead Urshifu and Frigorath, giving me a great start. I completely blow this by making an abysmal play. My opponent switches Chi Yu to Ogre Pawn and Terrace to Grass with Glamora, and I lock into Surging Strikes, doing almost nothing to the Glamora, putting up two layers of Toxic Spikes, and putting me so, so far behind. Despite the deficit, I managed to claw my way back into the game. If I can just get any kind of luck, a Heat Wave miss or a Bleak Wind miss or a critical hit, I'll be able to win. But it doesn't happen, and I suffer my first loss of the tournament in round 13. 12 wins, 1 loss. I'm not super thrilled to lose, but at the same time, my odds of winning game 1 were incredibly high, and I mean, I made such a bad play on turn 1 of game 3 that I don't really feel like I can complain. Rather than feeling frustrated, I take this loss as a sign that my play is starting to slip, and take the few minutes I have to center myself and try and lock in for the final rounds. But my next opponent is Ashton Cox, an incredibly strong player who I've played more than any other over the course of my career. Ashton and my sets are always close, and every time I have to play against him, I feel dread. This time, Ashton has a gouging fire team with King Gambit, Fluttermane, Rillaboom, Ogre Pond Water, and Porygon 2. This is not a bad matchup. I lead with Incineroar and Urshifu, and immediately lock into some tricky pivots. Ashton brings Gouging Fire, Ogre Pond, Rillaboom, and Fluttermane to game one. And what that means is that he doesn't have any way of stopping Ferrigarath in Trick Room. I switch around to get Ferrigarath in safely, set Trick Room up, and almost end the game in a single Trick Room by pairing Flare Blitz and Wood Hammer with Hyper Voice. Ashton manages to survive the Trick Room, but my Screaming Giraffe has done way too much damage, and I win the game. The game becomes so laggy after game one that Ashton and I have to restart our switches to try and get it to run, having waited 10 minutes trying to connect again. After this brief intermission, we begin game two, and game two features Wolfie's special trick. Ashton leads with Gouging Fire and Ogre Pond once again. I fake out Gouging Fire to stop a breaking swipe, Terastalize, and one hit KO Ashton's Ogre Pond. Ashton's remaining Pokemon are Rillaboom and King Gambit, neither of whom can handle Ogre Pond, and there's almost nothing he can do after this turn one. I win the game and the set, and with a record of 13 wins and one loss, guarantee I'm gonna advance to the final bracket. There's still one round left before then though, and I'm paired against Luka, an extremely strong player and the only other player in the entire tournament who has just a single loss. But at this point, we're both guaranteed to be making the top eight. So Luka asks if it would be okay with me if he forfeits this round. I had played a couple of his friends and me winning would give them better odds of advancing. Plus, this would allow him to save energy and maybe even hide his strategy against me. I am perfectly happy to take the win, and I use the time Luca has given me to grab some Japanese food from a nearby restaurant, giving me a much welcome break from the stress of the day as I sit with my friend Gio and chat while I eat. Before long, the other players have finished their matches, and the final eight players advancing to the single elimination bracket are announced. At this point, a single loss means your tournament is over. There is no more room for error. My first opponent is using a Pokemon that I haven't played against all weekend, Roaring Moon. It's actually really scary, as with Incineroar and Amoongus support, Fragorath is, for the first time all weekend, not very good. I work with my friend Justin to build a game plan, and eventually settle on something that I haven't done before, Incineroar and Fluttermane up front, with Rillaboom and Ogre Pond in the back. The battle starts with Incineroar and Fluttermane against Incineroar and Raging Bolt. To my shock, my opponent's Incineroar is slower than mine, meaning I can't parting shot into Incineroar to prevent the Roaring Moon from getting in for free. But just like with Swords Dance Ogre Pond, I can take advantage of the pressure Calm Mind applies, and instead just attack. I fake out and Moonblast the Assault Vest Raging Bolt, 
doing over 60% as it flinches, and Incineroar parting shots my Flutter main, bringing in the Roaring Moon. Boss battle time. I predict the Raging Bolt to switch to Amoongus and ignore it, Moon blasting the Roaring Moon. I get the switch correct, but Roaring Moon terrestrializes to Flying, and Moon Blast does pitiful damage against the now Flying type Moon, though Parting Shot does offset the Dragon Dance at least. I bring an Ogre Pawn and terrestrialize to Fire to KO the Amoongus as I switch Incineroar back in. But even after an Intimidate, Acrobatic still does a ton of damage to my Ogre Pawn. With the Pokemon lead, damage on both Roaring Moon and Raging Bolt, and an Intimidate drop on the Roaring Moon, I am able to eventually chip down my opponent's Pokemon, KOing the Roaring Moon and finishing the game with Fluttermane. In game two, my opponent switches up his tactic, leading with Fluttermane and Incineroar as I lead the exact same. I set up a Calm Mind as he terrestrializes and locks into Dazzling Gleam and I see an opportunity to go for the win. I protect Fluttermane and parting shot his Fluttermane, taking a second Dazzling Gleam with Incineroar. Now, my Fluttermane is plus one special defense and his Fluttermane is minus one special attack. Meaning, despite the choice specs and the Terra, he really isn't doing any meaningful damage. I use Rillaboom Fakeout to get another Calm Mind up and use the combination of Grassy Glide and Moonblast to KO his Ogre Pond before it can attack. The game is more or less over, since Fluttermane can just blow through the rest of his team, and I have both fakeout users to keep it safe still. But then, I make a huge mistake. I totally forget that I need three Calm Mind boosts to KO Fluttermane with Moonblast and not two. And because his Fluttermane survives, I end up losing both Incineroar and my boosted Fluttermane. This changes the score from being 4-3 to three in my favor to 2-3 to three in his. I just threw away the entire game. I had safe plays that I could have gone for that would have let me win without needing to take such a crazy risk. But the battle isn't over yet. I still have two Pokemon left and I'm not going to give up. I realized that basically the only way I'm going to win though is if I make a really big read and get it right. I decide to make the hard read that the unrevealed final Pokemon is Roaring Moon. And I make the call that my opponent is afraid of Fake Out and Swords Dance. If that's the case, Incineroar is going to switch into Roaring Moon this turn. So that's what I predict. Roaring Moon switches in for Incineroar, Fluttermane's Dazzling Gleam does no damage, and I launch a Terra Fire Ivy Cudgel into the Incineroar slot, which is now a Roaring Moon, and Woodhammer redirects and KOs Fluttermane. Now it's a two against one, and there's no way for Incineroar to beat my Ogre Pawn. I win the game and the set and advance to the semifinals with a record of 15 wins and one loss. And even though we tried to avoid it earlier, my next opponent would be Luka. His team is effectively identical to Ashton. He does have Chen Pao in place of Porygon 2, but since neither Pokemon is very good here, it's effectively the same team. The problem is that Ashton and Luka are friends. So Ashton most likely told Luka everything that I did in our set. In other words, I don't think that Wolfie's special trick is going to work here. And I'm also not sure that my game one strategy of going for pivots into trick room will work either. After a lot of thought, I decide to try a lead combination that I didn't use versus Ashton, Urshifu and Rillaboom. Luka leads off with Rillaboom and King Gambit, and we see that his grassy surge activates first meaning his Rillaboom is faster. Now, this King Gambit is a massive threat. It's really the best answer to my Fragraph, and as long as it's around, it'll be really risky for me to set up Trick Room. But the problem is, Luka leading with King Gambit could just be a bait. He has Fluttermane on his team, and if I try to go for a close combat and he just switches to Fluttermane, I could just lose the game on turn one. Of course, Luka might not even have Fluttermane, and getting rid of King Gambit turn one would make this battle so much easier for a Ferrigraf sweep. Also, both of us have fake up pressure, but there's also the threat of Ferrigraf switching in on my side. In short, there is a lot going on on this turn, and I don't think that there's like one right play that I can make. So I decide to play conservatively. The turn starts, and to my shock, I see a Terrastalization. King Gambit has Terrastalized to Dark? I could have just used Close Combat. Urshavu uses U-Turn, and I have a choice to make. Going into Incineroar means King Gambit will get an attack boost thanks to its Defiant ability. But going into Fragraph means it could get knocked out. And Fragraph is the most important Pokemon that I have. I guess I need to go into Incineroar, but oh man, that feels so bad. Incineroar's Intimidate gives King Gambit an attack boost. 
making it even stronger. I would hammer into the King Gambit slot, trying to get a wood hammer on the Fluttermane switch, and I do pretty good damage since it's not a steel type anymore. And Luka's wood hammer doesn't do much damage to Incineroar. Wait, did my wood hammer move first? Oh my god, our Rillaboom are speed tying. That won't be an issue this game though, as Luka's Terra Dark plus one King Gambit one hit KOs my Rillaboom and my heart sinks. That is a huge deficit to take this early on in such a crucial game. I'm forced to go back into Urshifu, but things are looking bleak. There's a plus one Terra Dark King Gambit on the field, and I still have to deal with this Rillaboom. Of course, I do have a safe play. I can close combat the King Gambit and fake out the Rillaboom, potentially catching me up on the Pokemon score. But I just have this feeling. I think I'm actually so far behind after that turn one that if I just take the safe option every turn, I have no hope of winning. Not against a player as good as Luka. So, I decide to make the single riskiest play I've made all tournament. Close combat into Rillaboom and parting shot into King Gambit. King Gambit's Defiant ability gives it two attack boosts if any stat is lowered. Parting shot lowers the attack and special attack of the target. King Gambit already has an attack boost from Intimidate. If parting shot connects, this King Gambit will get to plus four attack. I'll lose the game for sure, and most importantly, I'll look like a complete idiot on stream. But if I don't make a crazy play right here, I'm sure I'm gonna lose. My heart is beating like crazy as the turn starts and King Gambit switches into Gouging Fire. Close combat KOs Rillaboom and Incinera's parting shot drops Gouging Fire's attack. And just like that, I'm back in the game. Lucas forced to send out his final Pokemon, Ogre Pawn, as going back into King Gambit would just get it knocked out by Urshifu. Now, the obvious play is to switch my Urshifu back into Incineroar here. It gives me another Intimidate and gives me Fake Up Pressure next turn. Staying in and close combating again would be super risky. Not only does Breaking Swipe do damage and lower my attack stat, but Horn Leech from Ogre Pawn would pick up a one-hit KO and offset any damage I would do with Urshifu. I should switch. Gouging Fire goes for a Howl, and Urshifu's close combat brings Ogre Pond to yellow HP. Ogre Pond goes for an Ivy Cudgel, but even at plus one attack and minus two defense on Urshifu, it doesn't KO. Vrigaroff goes for a Hyper Voice, doing some chip and activating the Throat Spray, but not picking up a KO on Ogre Pond. But now I'm in position to win this game. I switch Urshifu to Incineroar to get rid of the defense drops and protect Vrigaroff but Luka predicts it and goes for an Ivy Cudgel to get the KO. Urshifu hits the field again, but now without defense drops, it's no longer in range from gouging fire. Luka goes for a Howl as close combat KOs Ogre Pond, and Foragraph drops gouging fire to low HP. King Gambit re-enters the field, and you might think this battle will come down to who is faster between Foragraph and King Gambit. But here's the thing, Luka's King Gambit's moveset is Protect, Swords Dance, Sucker Punch, and Cow Tau Cleave. Its only damaging moves are Dark type, and I haven't terrestrialized yet. Gouging Fire gets a critical hit breaking swipe to KO Urshifu, but it doesn't matter. With Terra Fairy, Frigoraph resists all of King Gambit's moves and becomes immune to breaking swipe. And even though King Gambit narrowly survives the Hyper Voice, it can't do enough damage in return. With the late game Terra, Frigoraph closes out the game. One more game and I'll be in the finals. This time I decide to switch my leads up going with Incineroar and Urshavu lead against Luka's Gouging Fire and King Gambit. Another battle where King Gambit starts out with an attack boost. And just like last game, I have to play this stupid turn one mind game of will the Flutter main switch in. I think about how Luka used King Gambit last game, and I realize that if he wants, he can go for Breaking Swipe and Terra Dark Cow Tau Cleave, a move that will only lose to Fake Out into Gouging Fire and Close Combat into King Gambit. Going for this play is super risky, as Fluttermane switching in for King Gambit will put me at an unrecoverable deficit. But I've been getting hard reads right all tournament. I'm gonna bet on my instincts. The turn starts, King Gambit terrace to Dark, and I feel like I've won the set. Fake Out hits Gouging Fire, Close Combat hits King Gambit, King Gambit survives, King Gambit survives? This is Urshifu! Super effective close combat, hello? Thankfully for me, King Gambit targets down Incineroar, not Urshifu, and it doesn't even do half my health. But seriously, what the heck? I realize that with the Terra Dark, attack boost, and defense drop on my Urshifu, Sucker Punch is probably gonna do a ton of damage. So I make the safe play, switching Fragoraf in. Luka's Sucker Punch is blocked by Armor Tail. Breaking Swipe does a little chip, and close combat finishes the King Gambit off. Ogrepon hits the field, 
Now, this time, I think it's safer to go for a switch to Incineroar with Urshifu because I was so aggressive last time, and I don't think Luka's going to target my Frigoraf anyway, so why don't I use this opportunity to go for a Hyper Voice? That way, I can set Trick Room the next turn and already have a boost for maximum damage. I switch to Incineroar, but Luka offsets Intimidate with Howl, and to my shock, Ivy Cudgel does a ton of damage to Frigoraf, dropping it to super low HP as Hyper Voice does just a little chip. Suddenly, my great position looks a lot more perilous. Now, the obvious move in this spot is to fake out Ogre Pawn and go for a Trick Room, since Gouging Fire probably can't KO Frigoraf. But knowing this, Luka's only play is to double target Frigoraf to try and stop the Trick Room. And knowing that, I can get a little cheeky. I Terrestrialize Incineroar to Ghost as a little insurance and protect Frigoraf. Both Luka's Pokemon attack into the Protect, and I Parting Shot the Gouging Fire down to minus two attack bringing Rillaboom in for another fake out and giving Fragoraf a turn of grassy terrain recovery. Luka switches Ogre Pond into Rillaboom and goes for a Howl as I fake out the switch and finally set Trick Room up. I want to make sure I don't lose my Pokemon too quickly in Trick Room since I do still have Scarf Urshifu in the back, so I go for Protect and U-Turn, but Luka calls it and double targets Rillaboom. Unfortunately for him, my Pokemon are too tanky and neither attack gets a KO, but with the chip on Rillaboom, it's now in danger. I KO Rillaboom and do a huge chunk to Gouging Fire, and the minus two Heat Crash does nothing to Frigoraf in return. Lucas forced back into his Ogre Pond, and Frigoraf chunks it down as I pivot out with Parting Shot back into Rillaboom. After the drop, Ogre Pond still can't KO Frigoraf, meaning the last turn of Trick Room is the end of Gouging Fire. I switch Urshifu in as insurance against a double protect and use it to finish off Lucas Ogre Pond. And with that, I'm advancing to the finals with a record of 16 wins and one loss. And imagine my surprise when I see that my opponent in the finals is none other than Nicholas Donnelly, with a record of 15 wins and two losses. Nick has beaten every single person he played against the entire tournament except for me. I have to deal with this awful matchup for a third time, more than I've ever played any one opponent in a single tournament before, and the maximum possible times any player can play against the same opponent in a single tournament. And because we've played so much already, things are getting really wonky. Nick has shown off five different leads in six games. Which one should I cover? I've never played the same opponent three times in a tournament before, and I feel like Nick is the one who gets to decide how the adaptations go because I won the other sets. I'm trying to figure something out with my friend Aaron Trailer, but we realize that we just don't have the time to build out a dedicated game plan. The only way I'm going to win this tournament is if I ball out and play out of my mind. Nothing more, nothing less. I decide to go with the Ogre Pond and Frigoraf lead I used to win the last game of the second set. Shouldn't immediately lose to anything, and I like it against most Tornadus and Iron Hands leads. Really, the only thing I don't want to see is that. This is a terrifying lead from Nick. Let's talk about why. If Nick terrestrializes either Pokemon, he can KO whichever of my Pokemon that he wants. If I try and target down the wrong Pokemon, Nick can protect it while attacking with the other to pick up a knockout and put me really far behind. My best offensive tool here is to terrestrialize Ogre Pond and try and get a KO. But if Nick predicts this, he can go for a Terra Fire with his Ogre Pond and a Follow Me to prevent my Ogre Pond from taking a knockout. And that's just the very obvious, like, base level stuff, not considering switches or anything. Just like in the first game with Luka, I'm overwhelmed by the number of options, and without a clear path forward, I decide to play defensively to scout for what my opponent wants to do. I switch Frigoraf to Incineroar as Nick terrestrializes his Ursaluna, and I spiky shield as he launches a Follow Me and Hyper Voice, doing a ton of damage to Incineroar, while I get basically nothing in return. That was a really bad turn, and with the threat of Frigoraf switching in, I haven't actually improved my position all that much. And the turn two is just as complicated as the turn one. I can fake out and swords dance if I expect a double protect or a follow me, but if Nick predicts that, he can switch to Frigoraf and attack, taking out either Incineroar or Ogre Pond. I can Terrastalize to Fire and Ivy Cudgel, but if Nick protects both, I'll be in a really bad spot the next turn. The problem is, I don't even know if Nick has Frigoraf in the back, and that's going to really affect what my best play is this turn. Without a clear path forward, I decide to cover for the double protect. I just need to pick an option and hope that I get it right. But 
I forgot about Wolf's special trick and it ends up really biting me. If I'd been super on my game, I'd have realized that the threat of Fake Out and Swords Dance would likely cause Nick to attack with Ursaluna. But after two sets against Nick and a tough set against Luca, I wasn't thinking completely clearly. We both switch in Fragraph, I Swords Dance with Ogre Pawn, and Ursaluna goes for a Hyper Voice, dropping my Ogre Pawn super low and doing over 50% to Fragraph. Let's take stock of the situation for a second here. I've lost over 50% of Fragraph and Incineroar, and almost all of my Ogre Pawn's health. The only damage I've done in exchange is, well, two turns of Ursaluna Life Orb damage, which it did to itself. This is going so badly. The plus side is my Ogre Pawn is now set up. I call Nick to not protect Ursaluna, and Ivy Cudgel takes out the big bear. My Fragraph goes for a Hyper Voice, activating the Throat Spray as Nick's Incineroar sets up Trick Room. I'm still in trouble, but that turn was a big step back into this game. Nick sends out Urshifu, and I'm forced to consider my position. I have no idea if Dazzling Gleam will KO Ogre Pawn here, but I feel like it might. I mean, I have like no health left. Maybe, I don't know. I decide to switch Incineroar in for Ogre Pawn and go for another Hyper Voice doing great damage to both of Nick's Pokemon, as he uses Dazzling Gleam and KOs my Frigoraph with Wicked Blow. With almost no health left on Ogre Pond, I'm forced to go into my final Pokemon, Urshifu. And now, there is another mind game going on. If I go for Flare Blitz with Incineroar into the Urshifu, I can knock it out, and I can knock out the Frigoraph with Urshifu's Surging Strikes. But what if Nick protects Urshifu? Then I would KO Frigoraf, and he'd be able to send out Ogre Pawn, who can KO my Urshifu in one hit under Trick Room. And with no health left on my Ogre Pawn in the back, that would probably be the end of the game. I don't see a clear way around this problem though, and with only a few seconds to figure out an answer, I decide to go with my gut. I don't know what the path to victory is, but I do know that I can't afford to knock out this Frigoraf right now. The turn starts, and I overthought things in a major way. I terrestrialize to water, Flare Blitz KOs Urshifu, Dazzling Gleam does a little chip to both Pokemon, and U-Turn fails to knock out Frigoraf. If I had just used Surging Strikes, the game would be over. But of course, that's not what happened. Now, Nick can go into his full HP Ogre Pond. But I think I see a way through this. If I knock out Frigoraph before it moves, I'll put myself in a 3 against 1 position. And with two powerful offensive Pokemon left, and Trick Room quickly running out, I should be able to win. But Nick makes a play I hadn't even considered. Rather than using his powerful Ogre Pond to attack, he instead uses Follow Me and saves his Frigoraph from taking a KO. And my heart rate spikes as I see Frigoraph's Dazzling Gleam come out. Damage because you can't knock off the item that that Ogre Pond oh, is holding. hangs on and Cinderark does faint. That Ogre Pond surviving there. Nick is not happy about that as the Ivy Cudgel now coming oh. down into the Ogre oh. Pond. But it's not going to go down either. And after all that, I've lost game one. There's still one turn of Trick Room left, Frigoraph Dazzling Gleam KOs Ogre Pond, and Ogre Pond Horn Leech KOs Urshifu. Wait a second, this Ogre Pond doesn't have Horn Leech, it has Wood Hammer. If it KOs Urshifu, it'll knock itself out with the recoil damage, and Trick Room will end. Then I can use Ogre Pond to finish off the Frigoraph, then it's just a 1v1 with Frigoraph against Ogre Pond, and I'm faster. I'm still in the game. It all comes down to if my Urshifu survives an Ivy Cudgel and Dazzling Gleam bit of damage but what did this ogre pond decide to do there's the oh it went for ivy what? cudgel ivy cudgel into the urshifu is just not gonna be nearly enough and so urshifu strikes a back one hit will do the job to finish off that ogre pond and that's gonna be lights out here for game number one somehow despite a truly abysmal start i win game one i am now one game away from winning the biggest pokemon tournament of all time I'm going to stick with the same lead for game two. I think it gives me the most flexibility against Nick's team as a whole. The second game begins with the exact same Pokemon, but this time I'm ready. I don't think there's any chance that Nick goes for a Terrifier Ogre Pond play after I switch to Incineroar turn one last game, which means that I'm safe to be a little more aggressive. The turn one begins and my Ogre Pond terrestrializes to fire, while Nick's Ursaluna terrestrializes to normal. Follow Me comes out, and I pick up a one-hit KO with Ivy Cudgel. Ursaluna uses Hyper Voice, doing huge damage to both my Pokemon. But Frigoraph launches a Hyper Voice of its own, and lands a huge critical hit. Ursaluna just barely survives, but it's now in range of a single turn of Life Orb Recoil, knocking it out. Compared to last game, this one has started out infinitely better. Nick sends out Urshifu, and I make an enormous blunder. 
I want to go for the Ivy Cudgel into the Urshifu and Hyper Voice. But then I realize if Nick protects Urshifu and goes for a Hyper Voice of his own, he can KO both my Pokemon. Now, there is a safe play here. If I protect with Fragraph and Ivy Cudgel with Ogre Pond, I'll cover every option. But I don't realize it. Instead, I overthink the turn completely and decide to attack the 1 HP Ursaluna with my Ogre Pond, which Nick protects, as his Urshifu KOs Fragraph. I go into Urshifu and overthink the turn once again, as Nick switches Ursaluna into Fragraph. I attack with Ogre Pond despite the obvious Sucker Punch, which Nick uses to knock me out before I can move, and use U-Turn into the now Fragraph instead of the stronger Surging Strikes for some reason. And suddenly, my incredible lead has been completely squandered. Because I never broke the Focus Sash, I can't KO the Urshifu in one hit. And with Fragraph blocking priority moves, Fake Out is off the table. Nick launches a Helping Hand Close Combat, KOing Incineroar in one hit. And with only Urshavu left in a one against three, I lose the game. The winner of the entire tournament will be whoever wins this final battle. In the moment, after a game like that, it is really easy to beat yourself up. I've been playing long enough to recognize, even in the moment, that I just threw away an incredible lead. If I lose this tournament, it'll be because of that game. But despite that, my mental game still feels strong. Did I just make a series of horrendous plays and potentially lose the tournament because of it? Yes. But at the same time, am I still in the tournament? Also yes. Everything that's happened so far is behind me. All that's left is to lock in and finish the job. Wait, why am I even leading Frigraph? Game 1, I just switched it out, and Game 2, it took a ton of damage. It's my best Pokemon in Trick Room. Maybe I should save it. At this point, I'm sure Nick is going to bring the exact same Pokemon once again. So my adjustment is to lead with Incineroar and Ogre Pond. And the leads are the same from Nick, Ogre Pond and Ursaluna. And just like last game, my Ogre Pond and Nick's Ursaluna terastalize on the first turn. Nick goes for a follow me, and once again, Ogre Pond's Ivy Cudgel picks up a one hit KO. But unlike last game, now Ursaluna goes for the Blood Moon this time, does not opt for the Hyper Voice, and that's gonna be able to take care of Wolf Terra immediately to start off this game. What a huge piece for Wolf to have off the board immediately. Incineroar goes for a parting shot into Urshifu, but the damage is done. But believe it or not, this was actually a good trade for me. I'm making the read that Nick's last two Pokemon are once again Frigoraph and Urshifu. And if that's the case, my Urshifu and Incineroar have just become incredibly threatening. The biggest threat to Urshifu was the Follow Me Ogre Pond, as it can tank a hit and protect its partners. Nick and I each send out a Pokemon to replace our fainted Ogre Ponds. Now I have a choice to make. Thanks to Urshifu's ability, Nick cannot go for a Protect this turn. Or I guess he can, but it won't do him any good. This makes Close Combat into the Ursaluna extremely tempting. But what if I'm wrong about Nick's last Pokemon? What if it's Tornadus, not Urshifu? Close Combat would do very little damage, and I would be totally out of position. At that point, a Tailwind would put Ursaluna in position to beat my entire team. Should I predict the Tornadus to switch in? No. I lost the last game because I overthought it. I'm not going to make that same mistake again. Less thinking, more punching. Huge swing here could turn the tides immediately. Blood Moon doesn't switch out! Close no combat switch. into the Ursaluna! It's That's a one-hit knockout! And Sonora's knockoff does huge damage to Fragraph and takes off its berry, preventing it from healing. Nick is forced to go into his final Pokemon, Urshifu Dark. This is it, the end of the game. Nick has Helping Hand and an Urshifu attack available to him. I could switch my Urshifu out here, but if Nick goes for close combat into Incineroar, or even Wicked Blow into Urshifu, it could backfire pretty hard. I'm gonna keep it simple. I'll attack with both my Pokemon. Frigoraph goes for a Helping Hand, but does it survive a knockoff? Frigoraph is gonna go for the Helping Hand though, really hoping does that it survive? will survive. Oh, the it just doesn't survive that. Unfortunately, Nick's Urshifu's close combat KO is my Urshifu in a single hit. I'm up two against one, but the battle is not over yet. Urshifu has the Focus Sash item, meaning I need to hit it twice to KO it. It can KO both my Pokemon in a single hit, and there are three turns of Trick Room left. In other words, I will win this game unless Urshifu gets a Triple Protect, a 1 in 27 chance. Surely it's not going to happen, right? It's gonna come down to the wire that Urshifu does get the first one, of course, but 
What happens in these next few turns? I haven't seen a triple protect on stream in so, so, so long. Urshifu goes for the protect. It fails. It's not going to be able to save itself from this one. The Flare Blitz from the Incineroar is going to deal so much damage to the Urshifu to put it on one last life as the Varigarath hopes to follow it up and get the KO with the Hyper Voice. And with that attack, Wolf Glit becomes your Charlotte Regional Champion, a time winner. The no King way. is back. Ladies and gentlemen, he took three months off this game and came back and shows it's just as easy as riding a bike, only dropping one set throughout the entire tournament. He was the victor of the previous largest tournament of all time, and now he is the winner of the newly largest tournament of all time. So with a final record of 17 wins and one loss, I win the biggest official Pokemon tournament of all time for the second year in a row. Winning this event qualifies me for the 2024 Pokemon World Championships, earns me $6,000, and brings my total regional wins up to eight, two more than the person with the second most wins. But more than all of that, it means something to me personally. Pokemon is a really hard game, and last year I gave it my all, but didn't get the result that I wanted. Instead, I got super burnt out. Taking a big four month break is something that most serious competitive players don't do, but I feel so strongly that it was the right thing for me to make sure I can still enjoy playing this game I love so much. And coming back with a huge win is a good reminder that even though you can't control how you do at every tournament, if you keep working hard, trying your best and taking care of what you need, you'll eventually strike diamonds.